Hello and welcome to The More You Know Co., a podcast about the people and ideas all around Northern Colorado. I'm your host, Ivan Wayne. Let's get rocking. Today's conversation features Michelle Provoznik, the executive director of the Gardens on Spring Creek. This is a wonderful botanical garden located smack dab in South Central Fort Collins. I had no idea this was even there, and I loved my experience and conversation uh, with Michelle. Before we started our interview, I had the opportunity to walk through the garden and actually check it out for about 20 minutes before we sat down in our office. If sometimes we seem a little distracted, like we're daydreaming, it's because her office features this huge bay window that overlooks both the construction at the Botanic Gardens that's currently going on and the rest of the garden. Hope you enjoy. All right, welcome. Here I sit in the office of Michelle Provaznik, the executive director of the Gardens on Spring Creek, which is a botanic gardens located in the southern heart, I would say, of Fort Collins. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah, well, yeah, I assume you're here a lot. So and that I'm, is true. Right. That is true. I'm happy to be here with you. Thank you for giving me the time. Nice Absolutely. To, yeah, nice to sit down with you. Um, let's start with the fact that I didn't know that there was a Botanic Gardens at Fort Collins. Is that a... Um, is that a usual reaction from people? Do you get that a lot? Uh, when I first started here 10 years ago, absolutely. Heard it all the time. As we've gotten older, have more things here to see and do, it's not as common as of a refrain as it used to be. Uh, that being said, uh, we still hear it and uh, are hoping that uh, we become more well-known throughout northern Colorado. Right. How do you stumble into this role in this world? Yeah. So interesting. I have a background in both business and um, my degree is in economics, international business. And then I also have another degree in horticulture. And um, prior uh, to some of that, I also worked in the political world quite a bit. So um, the Gardens on Spring Creek um, is uh, an enterprise and an organization, a nonprofit and city organization. So we're a public private partnership. So, you know, I have a role in the political world, so to speak, through being uh, in, in the city organization and then um, nonprofit experience and um, and then the horticulture. So it all kind of came together in this weird, perfect symbiosis for this position. Um, you know, when I was uh, working through my career, I don't think I ever really envisioned that this is where I would end up. But I love the world of public horticulture and public gardens, and it's been a great fit for me. Yeah, how did you... Uh, so are, are you from Northern Colorado? No, not originally. I'm originally from St. Louis. I've okay. lived in all four of the um, time zones in the United States, though. Oh, wow. So, Very yeah. nice. Yeah. Hopefully this one's your favorite. Yeah, Colorado has definitely become home. And how long have you been here? We've been in Fort Collins for about 17 years, and then we've also lived in Colorado Springs for six years. Oh, the Springs. I yeah. love Springs. Yeah. Yeah. So did you move here for this position or were you already in the, in the area? No, we this? moved here uh, for my husband's position, actually. And uh, I had just finished up my degree in horticulture out in California, and, and then we moved here. And so then I had to figure out what I was going to do in Fort Collins with a degree in horticulture and uh, started my own company and then was on the board of our nonprofit organization, the Friends of the Gardens in Spring Creek. So I was in that role um, as a board member and became president of the organization for several years prior to becoming then the director here when that position opened up. So did I hear you correctly that you started a business? Mm -hmm, I did. What was that? It was called The Garden Tender. It was a horticultural maintenance company, and I ran it for six to seven years, and then I sold it. Very nice. Yeah. Is it out there still doing things? Are you it aware? is. It's yeah. still out there. Um, I still I kept the name, but the business is out there. Some of the employees are still out there. They're doing what they do, so it's pretty awesome. So, where did you? What was uh, like? What were the details of that of that company? Um, what did we, it do? Yeah, so we um, focused on larger um, residential properties and small commercial properties, and. Um, did the horticultural maintenance on them. So we didn't do the lawns. We didn't do um, some of the more um, mundane sorts of um, um, tasks, but we did all of the, the higher level horticulture things. So planting and weeding and pruning and deadheading and all of those sorts of things to keep people's gardens looking the way they wanted them. Right. Did you do more residential or government contracts? Uh, I did both. 
both. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My friend in the Springs actually mm -hmm. is, um, I don't know all the detail, detail intricacies of it all, but he is on the, the side of helping companies get into government contracts. Oh, so yeah. So I'm kind of familiar with that world. Mm -hmm. Two years ago, I had no idea about it. And, yeah. Um, and so it's like, oh, so you mentioned that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I wanted to ask, you had two different uh, focuses in your um, your education, mm -hmm. business and horticulture. Mm -hmm. Where did that split happen and, and how did that um, evolve? Yeah, uh, it's it's kind of different. So my degree again um, in business, and then I went off to Washington D.C. and I worked in the U.S. Senate for three years, and so I didn't necessarily use my degree specifically there, but I've always had a business mindset, and um, it's how I, I I just view things. I think, and so um, what. I found, um, even when I was working in D.C., I started taking horticulture classes and landscape design classes, and it just became a hobby of mine. And then we moved to Colorado Springs and became even more of a hobby, even though I was still doing some political work um, uh, around the state. And then uh, we moved to California, and then that's where I decided to really pursue horticulture. I mean, if you're going to study horticulture anywhere in the country, California is a pretty awesome place um, to do it. It's so diverse with so many um, different um microclimates and, and that sort of thing across that state. So it was a fun place to, to study horticulture. And then came back here and was able to combine, obviously, the business and the horticulture together uh, to operate a business. And does the temperate weather in California, does it lend a, a longer season to, like, seasonal horticulture? Mm -hmm. Is that is that mm -hmm. another reason why it, you know... Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a year-round uh Enterprise. I mean, it, it has seasons, but it, and you know, it, it, depending upon where you're at. But um, I, we lived in the Bay Area, and you know, winter was wet and rainy, and there was still a lot of gardening to be done at that time. Right, right. Um, two years U.S. Senate, you said. Three years Three in the years. Senate. Uh -huh. What uh, What did you do there? That's, I worked on the neat. Commerce and Science and Transportation Committee in the U.S. Senate on the minority staff at the time. And uh, I was a professional staff member, so I was executive assistant to the staff director. And I also handled uh, political nominations and routed them through that process. And what organization was this? Could you say that again? It's the U.S. Um, Commerce, Science, and Transportation Committee. Commerce, Science, and Transportation Committee. Mm -hmm. um, so what type of things rolled through your office? Oh, all kinds of things. So we oversaw aviation, telecommunications, um, um, trucking, uh, a lot of science stuff. So NSF, National Science Foundation things, um, Department of Commerce things. Just uh, it was a really varied um, committee in, in the Senate and lots of different um, interests. Right. Do you feel like you walked away from that job and experience with stuff that influences your role today? You Absolutely. Take anything that, and what Absolutely. might that be? Um, so when I was working in the U.S. Senate, uh, it was very different than it is now. It wasn't quite as polarized as it is now that you keep yeah. hearing about. And there was a group of senators um, from both sides of the aisle that were moderates in their parties. And they would continuously work together um, to get things done. And that has been something that has stuck with me um, throughout my career is um, working with people to bring things together and get projects done and get, you know, in that case, get legislation passed. And so um, it was formative. It's pretty interesting when I can look back and think on it. And it's really what I've um, done here at the gardens. What I've always strived to do is partner with other organizations to enhance both missions and bring both organizations, make them stronger together. And um, I can, to trace that all the way back to my time in the U.S. Senate. Right. That's a big deal for the gardens on Spring Creek. You're constantly looking for partners, mm -hmm. endorsements, partnerships for donation, and probably special events. All of the above. Yeah. <laughs> and you feel like, um, yeah, that your your ability to, to kind of work in that nebulous middle region that probably has shrunk to uh, razor thin in recent years, that 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 uh, still helps you today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, I think that's something that people wouldn't think about a lot. No, and, um, and just as just... Yeah, and it, just as you you know, as you get older and further in your career, and you start looking at what's happening in the country, and you can look back. It, it's I don't know. It's been interesting to think about. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
What are your thoughts on the polarization? Oh, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to go there. <laughs> we're going to, yes. Appropriate response. We're going to fly right past that. Yeah, I, you jog my memory. Just walking around here bef- um, before we started this uh, conversation, I was walking mm-hmm. around the botanic gardens. I noticed like the different headstones, the different, uh, it's probably a bad word actually. Uh, um, donor recognition plaques. Donor recognition <laughs> plaques. Today I learned. And just thinking about all the different, the meetings and the, the partnerships and the proposals that you go through. Uh, I noticed that Whole Foods sponsors um, mm-hmm. a section back there. There's like the continental U.S. You divided up edible plants and uh, produce by um, region where it typically grows. Correct. And they sponsored that area. Mm-hmm. And it's made me think like your day-to-day um, you know, what does your day to day look like? Yeah, my day to day varies every day. Yeah. And so, um, I definitely spend a lot of time, um, cultivating relationships again with donors, partners, visitors, volunteers, board members, and, um, city leaders. So that definitely is a huge part of my time. Um, I also am in charge of budgets and, and that sort of thing for our organization and work with our nonprofit on, on those as well. Uh, we have a, small team of um, staff and then a very large team of volunteers and so ultimately that all rolls up to me one way or the other and um, trying to um, build a team and um, and have and recognize volunteers for all the work they do for us so that is a, a part of what I do and um, fundraising is a significant part of my job as well. Right. So, and that's for any executive director of any nonprofit, public private partnership, whatever organization. Um, we, even if we have fundraising staff, we still spend a lot of our time doing that. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was uh, neat for me to think about getting a, a glimpse into the background because a lot of people go to Botanic Gardens. They say, look at this, look at that. Mm-hmm. And um, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes that people don't people, consider. Yeah. People haven't thought about it. And, right. And, that's fine. When they're here, we want them to have a great experience, exactly. and we don't want them thinking about all the things that happen behind the scenes to make it work. And so. it was a it was a great space. Good. I will say, uh, I spent some time back there and walking around, yeah. and it was, uh, I enjoyed it. I'd never been here before. With that, this idea, uh, according to your website bio that I pulled mm-hmm. from, the idea started back in 1986 mm-hmm. for this type of thing to to exist in Fort Collins, and it wasn't pushed through. Until a uh, public election in 1997, and then the visitor center broke ground in 2004. So I'm, right. I'm assuming you weren't you weren't around for all this history. No, but you've I wasn't. learned about it. Uh, yeah, I definitely have learned about it. Yeah. Um, so I've been around the garden since I moved here to Fort Collins in 2001. Oh, 2001. Okay. Yeah, and so again, I was on the nonprofit board at that time, um, and was. Uh, here when we broke ground on this building and built the building and uh, whether nonprofit or staff, I've helped raise all the money for all the gardens here on site. Right. And um, up until our new expansion, which we've gotten some city funding for, all of the gardens have been built using private dollars. So that's been a huge effort on the part of our nonprofit and, and the community to make that happen. And what were those early days like before there was a visitor center? Um, so before we had a visitor center, the place was closed off. It was just it was an idea and a dream. And when we o- opened um, the visitor center, it you know we had a we had a building and but we didn't have any gardens around the site so we had to get busy and build gardens i mean you can call yourself a botanic garden but without a garden it's kind of hard to get people people super excited to come and see something right so we offered programs and some events and that sort of thing to get people here and get them to understand what this was and what it could be really at that point you know we had the visitor center but still very much a vision and a long-term vision and so we started raising money um, as a friends board for the children's garden Uh, it's our first garden that opened it's kind of in our front yard and it really um meshed well with our mission, which is to enrich the lives of people and foster environmental stewardship through horticulture. So really engaging children and families in horticulture made a lot of sense. Um, And so starting with the children's garden um, was what we chose to do. And the friends worked with the director at that time to make that happen. And then we just, once I got here after that in 2008, we 
took the one garden at a time approach. So we started then on the Garden of Eaton, which is where you saw the Whole Foods and the Continental U.S. Garden. So that's our three-quarter acre fruit and vegetable garden. And then we started on the Rock Garden after that, which you can't see right now. It's currently currently fenced off um, uh, due to construction around it. But uh, that opened up in 2011, and then we did our sustainable backyard after that um, with a outdoor classroom and timber frame structure. So lots of different things um, and really helped us learn how to build a garden and then how to maintain it and how to program it um, without getting um, – Learning how to do it well, I guess, would be the best way to put it, and making sure we really could absorb it into the staffing we had at the time and the um, funding we had at the time. So that was kind of how we approached it. And then several years ago, gosh, probably six years ago, we started looking at the rest of the site and realizing we couldn't keep doing it one garden at a time anymore um, for a lot of reasons. The biggest one being that um, our new expansion project is in the floodplain, and um, it's it's in a floodplain where it's a pond, so to speak, and a, or a bathtub if you want to look at it that way. So we have to keep the volume the same. If we add anything that raises the volume, we have to remove something else. So in order to create topography and grade the site we needed to do all of them at once so when you're out there our great lawn is is a depression and the soil that came out of there moved into what is now the foothills and is bermed up and it's much easier to um, describe when you're out there looking at the Mm -hmm. site but we people think we um, brought in a lot of soil and other things and we didn't we moved it all around to create topography and that was essential to really defining the spaces and making them unique and needed to be done all at once. I couldn't just do it piecemeal anymore. So um, we decided to do that project all at once. And then we also decided to complete our visitor center at the same time. That way also when we're going to donors, we have one ask for one large vision and one large project as opposed to um, keep going back um, every couple of years asking for the next thing. So we think it's worked out. And um, we were able to raise about $3 million for our garden expansion project. And we've raised a little more than $2 million, most of that coming from the city of Fort Collins for our visitor center. And we have a little bit more money to raise for the visitor center project as well. Yes. So, the not, construction out here is massive. It is. And it looks like it's coming along swimmingly. It is. It's coming along really well right now. And the contractor is just about to wrap things up, Chrissy Construction out of Longmont. They've been a pleasure to work with, and they've done some really great work out there. And uh, and then we're going to break ground, it looks like, in January on our visitor center. And so what that's going to do is um, – That'll double in size, uh, our current visitor center space. And we're adding a conservatory, which we're super excited about. So a plant conservatory. And we're going to partner with the Butterfly Pavilion in Westminster and operate it as a North American butterfly house, which people are super excited about. And then um, we're adding another community meeting room because our current classroom is maxed out. And then an expanded lobby and gift shop and, and those sorts of things. So that starts in January. Wow. Yeah. Lots to do. Lots going on. The conservatory, how is it uh, slightly different than a greenhouse per se? Yeah, so it this will be um, humidity controlled as well as temperature controlled, and it'll be warmer than what you would normally keep a production greenhouse. So we do have a production greenhouse here on site. And we're constantly moving plants in and out of it. And they're all plants in containers, one-gallon pots or in flats, that sort of thing. And um, we grow them and move them out uh, outside into one of our hoop house or other um, nursery areas um, that we have, where a conservatory is going to have um, semi-tropical plants growing in it year-round so they can reach maturity. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, so, you know, if it's from baby plants in the greenhouse to plants full size in the in the conservatory so that's kind of the difference i see right and you said you're partnering with someone yeah so with, is that for the live butterfly for the is, butterfly is, is part it, yeah. yeah so we know the horticulture side of um what a conservatory will be and um uh 
partnering with the Butterfly Pavilion. They are the butterfly experts in the state. And so having them be our partners and, and turning it into a North American Butterfly House just made a lot of sense. And um, both of us are super excited and to work together. It's been such a pleasure to work with their team. And we're also just excited about what this is going to bring to Fort Collins and it um, enhances both of our missions as organizations. Um, you know, they're... Um, uh, they consider themselves an invertebrate zoo, which is fantastic. And we talk a lot about pollinators and how um, the environmental stewardship part of our mission um, really does want to promote pollinators. And so having the butterflies be here to talk ab about the role of pollinators in horticulture just makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, this has come up a couple months ago. I don't know if it's some misplaced, forlorn sense of childhood, but... Uh, or the fact that I now live somewhere completely different than where I grew up. But hmm. I feel like I notice butterflies out and about less than I used to. I don't know if that's a thing. Um, but it, it is wonderful for me to hear that you're all doing a butterfly exhibit here. And mm -hmm. that um, there's like a partnership going on about it. Um, but it's just something I desire to see more butterflies out in the wild. Mm -hmm. and, and when I do hear, I'm like, oh, I stop and it's like, oh my gosh, like, look, there's a butterfly. Yeah. You see them on, on hikes and such. But. Yeah. They make you pause. Yeah. Which is the, the beautiful part of it and just really appreciate where you're at. Yeah. So. Something about them and, and other certain animals that you feel like you're witnessing something special. Mm -hmm. I don't know why that is. If it's just the aesthetic of a butterfly um, or the fact that of, of all the roaming free space that that small, tiny creature could flap its wings, it flew right in your field of vision. Right. You were at the right place at the right time. And find that flower. Uh-huh. Right, yeah. And flowers are the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, going up and walking into meadows on hikes and just finding the mountain flowers and mm -hmm. whole sweeping meadows of light purples and yellows is yeah. something that where I'm from in Oklahoma, we didn't experience. <laughs> so uh, it's just great to, yeah. to see and interact with. And nice. that's why I enjoy places like this. Absolutely. So that is super. You said a lot there that I want to touch on. Um, one of those is when you all design a space, mm. what does it look like? Like who, I assume it's a team effort, but uh, when the when the pen goes to paper and the concrete starts getting poured, how, that, how are those decisions made? That seems yeah. like that, is a, that could be a tricky avenue. It is a tricky avenue. So um, in both cases, we hire professionals um, for our garden expansion project. We went through a uh, request for a proposal um, process that the city does and found a local landscape architecture company, Russell Mills Studios, who helped design um, the gardens out there, still basing it on the original master plan that we had and um, staying pretty true to that intent, which was really awesome. And uh, we're fortunate that Russell Mills has worked on other public gardens around the country so that they bring some expertise to that. But we also, when we were in the design process, brought in stakeholders from across the city and other organizations. So environmental educators um, were brought in to help us because of all the naturalistic gardens we're doing out there. Uh, environmental education will be very much a part of what we do. So bringing them in and getting their feedback on what can be out there was important. We also brought in um, our local arts uh, organizations um, from the Lincoln Center and our local performing arts um, um, organizations as well. To really talk about, like, with the stage design, you know, how many people need to fit on there? What size should it be? You know, we have a loading dock on the stage because they recommended it, and boy, were they right. And so learn, learning from people who, um, who are going to use the space as well as who are experts in their field was important. And then obviously we also had staff be a part of it and our friends board be a part of the design process um, for that as well. And then for the building, we're doing a little bit different process. Um, it's called a design build process. So we're actually working with the designers and the contractors who are going to build it simultaneously, which has been a really interesting process. It um, really ensures that budgets and design are working together because sometimes they don't. We've mm -hmm. gotten really fortunate with our garden expansion project that our, the budgets uh, and design worked well, but we still had to go and get a, a different um, contractor to build it and go through a, a process for that. So now, you know, they're working together from the very get-go and um, 
keeping the ultimate goal in mind. So that's been really fun to see. And again, we've brought in um, some stakeholders, um, primarily the Butterfly Pavilion, helping us with what the mechanics and what the house should look like and for the butterflies uh, and that sort of thing, as well as staff who are living in the space, understand how things work around here and how the flows need to happen and that sort of thing. So that's been the, the primary stakeholders. And in addition to all sorts of different city of Fort Collins staff who are experts in mechanical and electrical and all of those sorts of things as well. So a lot of our operations staff has been involved in the process. Right. Is it a challenge to say, this is the edit, you know, we're on the, we're on the 18th iteration. Mm-hmm. Oh, I got one more idea. Yeah, at some point, uh, um, we, you know, we're still in design phase right now, so I'm lucky <laughs> I can still go through and say, yeah, we're, we don't like this. We need to change this. Um, but at some point, we'll have to pretty much, I, I don't want to say live with it forever, but, you know, there's there will be some times where we're, we're going to have to say we, we can't change this at this point, but we're not there yet, so that's right, good. Right, right. Yeah. But even, I, I feel like, uh, especially with uh, plants that are, sometimes cycled out because they're annuals once a year mm, yeah. um, or just living things um, sure the concrete gets bored and the like the, the slope and the shape of the mm-hmm, area mm-hmm. is decided but I feel like even after that there's a lot of changes you can make gardens are never done right uh, yeah. yeah I guess that's we are I always getting. changing them and always tweaking and always trying something new and so that for me is the fun part too yeah yeah that's um, that's neat so I wanted to circle back to the Garden mm-hmm. of Eden because yeah. I wanted our listeners to s- realize that Eden is spelled E A T I N apostrophe. apostrophe, right? Exactly. Um, and that is a you said one point something. It's acre? a three quarter acre fruit three and vegetable acre. garden. Yeah. yeah, and we built it with three primary purposes in mind. One to showcase what food crops grow here in northern Colorado. It's a lot. And how to grow them sustainably. And so there's different things we do out there. And we have some signage out there describing why we do what we do. And then um, we added the outdoor teaching kitchen as well because we wanted to showcase not only growing food, but what to do with food. Um, you know, Growing fruits and vegetables, as we all know, fruits and vegetables are some of the healthiest things you can eat you know, or not, depending upon what you do to them. So we want to have, uh, you know, cooking classes because growing food is great. Knowing what to do with it is even better. We also have preservation classes so people know how to preserve the harvest. And so I know we have one of those coming up again this fall. And then lastly, we grow thousands of pounds of produce in that garden. And every year we donate to the food bank for Larimer County through our Plant It Forward program. And last year, I believe it was about 6,000 pounds of produce that we donated to them. And it's produce picked fresh at its peak, not not a few days old from the grocery or wherever else that they can get some food donated, which is all good. But um, I know they get really excited when they see our produce come in the doors and that of other gardeners. So our Planet Forward program um, invites all local gardeners to donate their extra produce. And we act as a drop-off point, um, mostly on the weekends, but it's become throughout the week as well. I had a huge bag of squash come in today. <laughs> and so we make sure that the food bank gets it so they can distribute it to their families through their um food share program as well as through their other organizations that they provide food to as well so and that is awesome on, yeah i think on, last year was yeah. forty thousand pounds of produce wow um forty thousand pounds pretty amazing from our gardeners across our community yeah, yeah. and forty thousand like this is a decent sized space but forty thousand pounds yeah well forty thousand is from time. everybody in the community but oh, yeah right, it's right. still i mean it's significant you know yeah. And we try to tell people no donation is too small. If you have an extra bag of beans, bring it in. No point in them, you know, rotting on your kitchen counter. We've got people who could use them. So. Right. And especially crops grown here, mm-hmm. naturally, quote mm-hmm. unquote, organic. Yeah. Right? People yeah. love that word. But like fresh, um, fresh fruit that you saw grow, um, that type of food makes a difference. It does. In people's health, how they're mm-hmm. feeling, mm-hmm. and I love to go to farmers markets for that reason because you mm-hmm. know, uh, quote unquote, it's it's healthier, right? Mm-hmm. You know where it comes from. It's not industrialized, but I also I also think there is power in knowing that you're eating food that someone in your community tended to right. and that they made. Absolutely. And um, I don't know if they say it verbatim, but I'm I'm sure that uh, the food bank and people who um, operate within the food bank 
are very appreciative. Yeah, oh, they awesome. are. Absolutely. Yeah. Again, yeah. another community partnership that's been longstanding, and um, we appreciate what each one of us brings um, to the partnership. So, yeah. yeah. That's super neat. I'm very glad to hear that you all do that. It's very yeah. cool. Yeah, and I don't know that we touched on it, but um, there's a section of the garden called the wetland demonstration. Is there that, is. is that currently it's in the off? It's in the expansion area, okay. yeah. Um, and it got expanded quite a bit. So, again, in order to make the foothills and create berms to make it feel like you're I mean, kind of in the foothills, we need <laughs> to give it some topography, right? Yeah. Um, we expanded the wetland to help build build that garden so um yeah the, there's a platform and a boardwalk and we'll start planting that in a couple more weeks so that was that is a um that's an intention to have it as natural as possible to, mm-hmm. to mimic a true wetland it is and did you intentionally put animals out there or did they no of, like, but they're here <laughs> they, they, can't, they found it <laughs> they, they said, did Home. they found it there um we have Obviously, the geese have found it. They found that really quick. Um, but what was really fun, at one point I was walking out there this summer, and the the edge of the wetland was, um, from the water to the, the soil, thousands of tiny black tadpoles. Thousands. It was so amazing. And then they all turned into toads. And so we had all these little baby toads hopping all over out there. So And you'll still find them out there at different points. So that's been fun to see. And we have... Um, at least one fox that's been showing up again. So we, the fox population was hurt a few years ago by mange and are slowly making a comeback. So we've had a couple young foxes around, which we're really happy about because we also have rabbits that we're not as excited about. So, um, yeah, th- there's plenty for the foxes to do. Rabbits aren't respecting the no, donations. Go to yeah, food that's exactly right. They yeah. really like the vegetable garden. <laughs> The fox will run some nighttime uh-huh, security. Exactly. Yeah. That's the goal. That is so neat. Yeah. yeah. And so I wanted to touch on some of your, your expansion. Mm-hmm. First, um, you said that it might be opening around January. Did I hear that correct? Well, so our um, – no, we're starting construction on our visitor center in January. Okay. What it's looking like is we will do a grand opening for both – both expansion projects at the same time and it's looking like fall of 2019 so in about a okay. year okay. we'll open year. up everything yeah so um, there's four new places in the future the first is the great lawn mm-hmm. so what will that area be so that is a uh, about a half acre lawn and it has a stage and um yeah, it, it's quite something. We're super excited about yeah. it. And it's surrounded by theme gardens. So you're no matter what you're there for, you know you're in a garden. Um, and so that's going to be where we have some small concerts, maybe some plays, weddings, yoga, um, poetry readings, um, that sort of thing. It'll also be one of the gathering spaces when we get a field trip of kids here. Uh, all of a sudden we're, uh, you know, 100 kids running around. So um, sometimes we'll be in the children's garden and sometimes we'll be out in the lawn area. So that'll be fun to see that teeming with life of youngsters running around. So that'll be fun. And, um, yeah, so that's going to be the great lawn. For the listener's knowledge, sometimes we stop talking and kind of like <laughs> stoically look off. Look like out the distance. We're sitting right here by a huge uh, open bay window to the garden and we can see the construction. So exactly. just, in, just in case uh, people are curious. <laughs> I hope like, why are they pausing? <laughs> right. You know, are they uh, distracted? Um, and and the answer is yes, we're distracted. Right. But by the beauty and uh-huh. the progress. Exactly. Outside. Exactly. So another part of your the the future expansion is the undaunted garden. Yeah. So the undaunted garden is designed by a member of our team. Uh, her name is Lauren Springer Ogden, and she is an internationally known landscape designer who calls Fort Collins home. And her books are called The Undaunted Garden. And so it's going to be a waterwise garden or a xeriscape garden. Waterwise is probably a term people understand a little bit more. And she's known for creating beautiful spaces that are waterwise. And that is something that we want to promote here, uh, given that we live in a high desert climate. So, um, again, going back to that environmental stewardship um, component of our mission, but also then the beauty of horticulture combined. And so we're super excited about um, what it's going to look like, obviously, but also the education potential and um, showcasing new and different plants to our visitors that they may not think about being able to grow here. 
Yeah. What was the other word you used for water-wise? Xeriscape. Xeriscape. Yeah. And so, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but this means plants that are more hardy, or it's a, it's a, um, or is it like that? The, the plants kind of like feed each other based on their water cycle? No. Is- so it's plants. Totally wrong. Wa- <laughs> quite <Oops>. a right. <laughs> um, so plants that are water wise, meaning that they don't require as much additional water as some of our traditional plants. Okay. So, you know, lawns typically aren't considered water wise. Mm-hmm. For example, that's just the most basic one I can share. Um, but there's all sorts of plants that if you group them with other um water-wise plants, you don't have to water that space as much in general. Once they're established, I should say. Everything is water when you first plant them mm-hmm. until they get established in the ground. So, um, again, you know, back in the day, it used to be junipers and rock and cacti, and that was about it. And now there's, you know, the science has come forward and um, a lot more information sharing has happened. And so there's a lot more plants available um, whether they're natives or not, um, that are water-wise plants. And so some of them are coming from other parts of the world with similar climates, and some of them are natives. And so combining them in a beautiful, aesthetic way to get people excited about planting them in their landscapes. Mm. You've mentioned in just your work alone, in your time span, that you've seen water-wise go from a handful to arguably hundreds. Do you mm-hmm. think that was just sharing of knowledge these were out there, or are you saying we've, we've actually even discovered things in them no i think it's i think well um there's more information sharing with different regions of the world and more people are looking at it from a a global perspective um so you know there will there's just plants coming from other regions you know denver botanic garden has a new garden called the step garden and so there's plants there from mongolia and just other parts of the world Mm. that have similar climates and they're all step climates so looking at what those are around um, in each of those zones and, and highlighting them. So we'll have some of those in some of these gardens as well. It, um, it, another two gardens that we're planting are the prairie and the foothills gardens. And those are large gardens focused solely on our native plants. Okay. Um, where the Andanta garden, we're going to have some of these other plants from other parts of the world. Right. Um, because they're being cultivated here and, and, um, and it makes sense for people to try them and add something different to their landscapes. It seems like a super fun challenge to think about what plants do we not already have, what plants maybe aren't native, but Mm -hmm. similar climate, maybe Mm -hmm. a little different, but Mm -hmm. still could survive here, could mix well. That seems Mm -hmm. like an endless pursuit to There are people who make their whole career on it. Absolutely. It's really um, fun. There's plant explorers, and that's what they go and do. Right. There's um, right out here in the kids' garden in my walk around, um, just about like an hour ago. There was a plant I saw, and the type of flower is escaping me. But it's right when you walk in to the left, and it has like a, it's black, and it has like a velvet feel to it. It's the black mamba petunia. Petunia. I've mm-hmm. never seen that. Yeah, and, isn't it cool? I walked in. I was here for five seconds, and I I see a flower I've never. Laid my eyes yeah, on the it. color is intense, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's and really I, different. I didn't know it was it was a pot in the kids' garden. Uh-huh. I figured this petunia probably has been touched before, so I, <laughs> I couldn't resist. I just I don't know if I wasn't supposed to. You're fine, you know, but it was so neat, and I I feel like there are a lot of people who have a similar experience when they come here. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's really fun to see um, whether it's a flower or a different shape of a leaf or a child watching. Uh, a ladybug climb on a plant uh, you know there's different experiences and subtleties throughout the entire space that um are just waiting to be explored right i also find it so neat and fascinating that um if you build it they will come the animals <laughs> showed up and yeah i saw uh you know to your wetlands exhibit and then i saw there was a placard out there about bees and mm-hmm. that you intentionally plant flowers that attract bees and did you probably didn't import the bees they just found it they find right? it mm-hmm. exactly so neat. yeah at different times um on these pots right outside my office we'll have hummingbirds uh buzzing around them and uh feeding off the flowers in the pot so i mean it's yeah it's nature at its finest yeah and butterflies i know mm-hmm. it's common knowledge they migrate but i think um, it would be foolish for us not to respect the magnitude 
of the travel of a butterfly, this mm-hmm. thing that is moved by the most subtle of winds, and yet they travel thousands of miles. It's crazy to think on about. annual bit. Yeah. yeah, nature is so cool. People <laughs> say nature is boring; they haven't been outside enough. That's right. That's that's what I say without sounding too hippie here. Um, <laughs> so, I saw here uh, on the website, eighteen acres is the whole property. Mm-hmm. Now, is that that's increasing, or is that after the expansion? Um, so, eighteen acres is the whole property. Okay, and we are adding. We will have 12 acres of developed gardens in total. So um, there's another six acres that will be outside our fence, which the Spring Creek Bike Trail cuts through. And that also is um, a small pocket park called Lilac Park that hasn't been fully developed yet either. So um, there's potential for more park-like amenities to go out there. But as terms of developed gardens, it's going to be 12 acres in total that we've developed. Okay. Yeah, I saw that bike trail. I saw mm-hmm. some people riding out there. It's the busiest section of trail in all of Fort Collins. Really? Yeah, because we're right by the campus, and it's in the east-west corridor connection Mm -hmm. yeah so it's residential plus you got the university right here and businesses and such do you get a lot of people who stop in and say hey i saw you from the bike trail what's been funny is once we started construction of the gardens project so many people started coming in wanting to find out what was going on like they they drive by it every day Mm -hmm. uh, on their bikes going to work or whatever and finally once they started seeing construction wanted to check it out and see what was happening and and you're sitting here like we've been here for a while (laughs) Now that we got all, we're tearing it up. Now you want to come by, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's all good. The yeah, but the huge stage does add a different ambiance out there. Like it does. It What's kind of funny is where we're located and how we're situated, and our building is very nondescript, flat roof, and we're kind of tucked in a hole. Yeah, I was and that when I so in. people drive by it all the time, not realizing that they've driven by the entrance, and so um, having the stage has really. And, and having some topography as well as the height of structures out there has helped a lot. You can actually see us from Center Avenue, which is kind of nice. Right. Yeah, driving up, the renovation and the stage was much more obvious than I thought it was going to be. It was like, yeah. bam, right uh-huh. there. So yeah. it would be so neat to have events out here. And you yeah. might pull people in for an event mm-hmm. that otherwise might not have stopped by a botanic garden. Yeah, and we do that now, but we expect that to just increase and happen more in the summer months. Our biggest event right now is our Garden of Lights show. It's a holiday show where we create flowers and insects and other things out of um, LED lights. And it's become pretty well known. Last year we had 30,000 people come through wow. the exhibit uh, throughout the month of December. So, And they come from all over. You know, we get them from Greeley, we get them from northern Denver, we get them from Cheyenne. So um, we're excited about that. And it's it, it opens up to people, as you said, who don't necessarily think about coming to a botanic garden. It, it brings them for other reasons. And so events definitely help us um, open up their eyes and, and invite them in for different different things right do you all in-house design the light displays that you're going to put up do yeah Yeah. um and then once we open the expansion next year the whole light show will go all around the great lawn area as well so then we might need a little more professional help but for now we do it all in-house that's very neat yeah it's pretty fun yeah Yeah. and then you all are coming up on a halloween event as well we are yeah halloween enchanted garden it's a candy free event which a lot of parents really like and uh, kids, he, the jury's yeah, out. Yeah, I know, right? No, they love all the games. I mean, we do things yeah. like pumpkin bowling and witch's hat toss, and there's magicians, and we do some fun mad science stuff um, with in partnership with our Museum of Discovery, and just all sorts of just fun um, crafts and games, kind of old fashioned. Mm. And uh, and people love it. So and it's just fun to see you know all the kids and adults in their costumes uh, running all around having a great time. Let's see. Yeah. Earlier you mentioned classes, mm-hmm. um, the the cooking, um, composting, and then I noticed there was a theme throughout several pages of the website, and that was urban homesteading. Yeah, Can you touch on that. Yeah. So urban homesteading is. Um, 
kind of a philosophy or a lifestyle that several people have started embarking on. And so some of that is gardening and growing your own food and growing for pollinators and, you know, raising, raising bees. Um, some people grow hops so they can make their own beer and other, other sorts of fruits to make wine. So it, it really is about creating a more um, self-sustaining lifestyle. And so composting would be a part of that. Canning and preserving is a part of that. Um, all kinds of things. We've done cheese making and chickens and just uh, it's a whole variety of things. And every year the classes kind of change and um, we offer new things and and it's um, fun. And in July we partner with Loveland Youth Gardeners and have the NOCO Urban Homestead Tour. And it showcases six homes, three in Fort Collins and three in Loveland, of people who are embracing the urban homesteading lifestyle and at different levels, some are all in and some are just getting going. And it's just fun to see the different ways people incorporate it into, into their homes and yards. Right. And people can get an idea. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't know what we don't know. So right. we don't know what's possible. Exactly. That's super neat. So people travel around in a group and go to these six Yeah, homes. they just, it's a, they, they dry themselves. So right. it's just um, a self-guided tour. Um, but yeah, it's, it's pretty fun to, to just see what people are up to. Right. That is super neat. Yeah. yeah. I did not read that. That's that's very cool. And then your greenhouse is year-round. Are there ever any visitors in there? Yeah. Or- uh, people are welcome into it any time. And right now it's full of uh, Christmas plants, believe it or not. Mm. So poinsettias and Christmas cactus are growing. We sell them during our Garden of Lights event. And then it's also full of perennials that we have been growing for our plant sale um, next May. So we have a big spring plant sale. We partner with um, Front Range Community College and CSU's horticulture departments. They grow different plants, and we bring them all here and do one big community plant sale that raises money for all three of our organizations. Oh, that's super neat. When does that take place? On Mother's Day weekend. Mother's Day weekend. Mm-hmm. That's very cool. I teach at Front Range. so Oh, I didn't it's know nice that. That's great. Yeah. yeah. It's a great partnership and collaboration. It gives the students some real-world experience um, growing a crop for um Retail sale is definitely something that um, they need to learn how to do. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, it's it's a great collaboration. And it's super neat because these types of things are contagious. I mean, you Mm -hmm. get multiple universities, the food bank, you get volunteers involved, and you get all these connections made, um, um, just building this sense of community. And it's all started by plants Mm -hmm. and and just an, an intentional desire to bring people together and get them working with their hands or get them to to take an hour or two or a day to just soak in the beauty out here it's a, it's, it's, it's a neat environment that's great and you summed it up really well <laughs> yeah it's like someone <laughs> yeah I, people always ask me what's the favorite part of my job and ultimately it's the community building aspect of what we do you know we do it around gardening and plants um but building community is is the part that makes it fun yeah i didn't see any updated i don't know if you have updated data but uh, on the website it said that there was about fifty thousand people that came through in 2012 mm, last year we had seventy thousand people seventy thousand very mm-hmm. nice yeah and once we're all said and done with all the expansion stuff we expect 100 to 125 thousand people yeah because the space is yeah, we're we're bigger, doubling right? in size in every way. Our visitor center will double in size, and our gardens are doubling in size. So, a lot more spaces to put people to. Right. I don't want to put you on the spot, but how often do you take a trip out there? Is it every day? Oh, oh, yeah. Every day. Yeah. <laughs> every day. Some days it's to get away from the computer, and other days there's so much going on. I need to be out there and a little more hands on. So. Yeah. I think many people listening would be envious of you that uh, right outside your office is a sprawling 16-acre wonderful Mm -hmm. landscape that you can meander through and um, that's yeah that's super neat when you walk through is it uh, is it hard not to think about all of the steps it took to to get there or is it uh, are you allowed to actually like Um, kind of disconnect so to speak it depends on the day (laughs) and the reason that i'm out there some days i just go out and i can just enjoy it for what it is and and um, see the beauty that we've created and that's pretty special and other days it's wow we got a lot to do so it just depends on on what's going on 
Right. You ever out there walking and you just you get the best idea. You have to write it down. And uh, notes yeah. And just... um, they don't like it when I start gardening because then I create a bunch of ideas. <laughs> and then I come back and I'm like, oh, we got to do this, this, and this. So. The to-do list grows. Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 Um, so outside of this place, coming to Fort Collins and being in northern Colorado now here mm-hmm. for, remind me how many years? 17. 17 years. What is one or two things that sticks out to you when you think about Northern Colorado that you've enjoyed? Mm. Or Fort Collins specifically? Yeah. Also. Um, I think just our community's passion for the outdoors um, is pretty special, whether you're recreating or just enjoying. Um, It's one of the reasons why we moved here, and it's, you know, it's one of the reasons why most of us have moved here, right? Um, So I think that and then this community's um, ability to collaborate has been unlike anything I've seen any place else I've lived. Um, just people are open to the idea of discussing possibilities and how can we work better together. And um, I think that's pretty special, and I don't see it everywhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll touch on both of those. One, mm-hmm. it is funny when you travel somewhere where going outside and enjoying the outdoors is not a thing. Mm-hmm. And it becomes apparent. You know, it's it's kind of like the story of uh, um, two young fish are, are swimming down into the ocean. And an old fish, do you, you know the story? Mm-hmm. An old fish is passing them and says, uh, enjoy the water. And they say, what is water? Mm-hmm. You know, they don't even know. Yeah. And so sometimes you can forget. Right. out here you know we have the rocky mountains in our backyard mm-hmm. and uh i try not to take it for granted yes the second thing is the ability to collaborate and or the, the willingness to collaborate mm-hmm. i for this podcast so far all the leads have come from two sessions that were not longer than two or three hours of just sending cold emails to people that's cool i thought that I would run into a wall pretty soon where I had to start out going out and vouching for people. Hey, I'm not a freak. I am who I say I am. <laughs> Please talk to me for an hour uh, about this podcast. And I haven't had to. People are people who respond say, "Sure, what works for you?" Right. And we set it up. Yeah. And that it's been refreshing. Nice. So it's been a good experience. And That's great. I agree. So. Oh, thank you for meeting me here on Wednesday afternoon. I'll let you get back to things. But if people want to reach out, ask how they can volunteer, get connected here at mm-hmm. the gardens, um, what's the best way to do that? Uh, probably the website, fcgov.com slash gardens, or just Google Gardens on Spring Creek and you will find us. Right. And do you all have a beer event coming up? Or we just, just had it. Just we just had, had it. it. It was okay. a really fun evening. Um, yeah, our next event isn't now until Halloween and then Christmas. So, the holiday lights. Okay. Well, hopefully we can get some more people to come out here and enjoy this. That'd be great. And, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. I want to say a very special thanks to Russell Isaac Long, the man responsible for writing and mixing all the music tracks used here at the Morinoco. If you'd like to access any content in addition to these episodes, check us out on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at The More You Know Co. If you have ideas for people you'd like to hear on the show, hit us up at the email themoreyouknowco at gmail.com. Until next time, peace!